So yeah, just briefly, I guess, about me. Um, my name is Latifa and I'm a, so I've got a few, I do a few things. So um, I'm a press officer at a non-profit global media organisation called Internews. So they basically provide local journalists and media with um, financial support and just like physical support to create local media, radio stations, newspapers and stuff like that. So that's my full-time job. And then on the side, I'm a freelance journalist and a writer, and writer and I've been doing that for just over five years now. So I write features, office pieces, interview features, name it kind of for a lot of different publications. So I've just put some of my bylines in this slide as well. And like I said, some of you might know me from Create Your Collective too, which I'll speak about a bit um, after as well. But yeah, that's just some of the things I do. Cool. Um, so I think, I mean, I reckon most people are probably here now. Okay. So yeah, you can get started if you want. Okay. Yeah. So like I said, that's pretty much a bit what I do and some of you might know me from Career Girl Collective as well so I'll just speak very very briefly about this then we'll get into it so Career Girl Collective <clears throat> sorry the platform I started last year in March so we're like so we come up to our 30th anniversary and I kind of saw the platform as me paying it forward to a lot of the women writers who helped me throughout my career because when I was starting out I was just I was I was all over the place and I had so many women writers who re reached out to me who experienced who helped me who wrote some of my pictures for me and gave me really good advice so I just see this platform as me paying it forward so yeah, that's so, so it's like you said, we post job um, writing tips, resources, job opportunities, pitch call outs, all that kind of stuff. So if you guys want to give us a follow, you haven't got to, but if you'd like, it's fine. Um, but yes, that's also where some of you guys might know me from. So yes, yeah, so I do that freelance journalism and a full-time job. So yeah, um, I do quite a lot. <laughs> but yes, that's what, that's about me then. Um, so yeah, what to expect from this masterclass? I'm gonna be sharing a few tips and suggestions some examples that I, that real life examples that I actually do use and some additional resources at the end. So in terms of the actual structure of it, the first part is gonna be mainly for those who have a full-time job or like working retail or catering, for example, or wanna do freelance journalism and writing on the side. Then we're gonna talk about the power of networking, how that can get you a lot of freelance opportunities. And then I'm gonna kind of go into um, how, to find, how to find those opportunities. And then just to end, we'll talk about some of the frequently asked questions that a lot of people wanna know about. So invoices, taxes, all the boring bits, I guess, well, invoices are not boring because you get paid, but you know what I mean, all the like finance part that everyone kind of gets worried about. So that's going to be towards the end. So hopefully you guys don't get bored with me talking for 40 minutes, <laughs> hopefully. So yeah, um, this, I just wanted to pull these stats because I wanted to make it very kind of clear in like, in like, in like a stat form that it's very much possible for you to have a full-time job and a side hustle and not overwork yourself. Like I'm sure that 78% of millennials are not overworked and have no time for social activities and hobbies with their friends. Like that's not always the case. And it's very much possible to make a lot of money and do it on the side, obviously depending on how much time you can give to it, which we'll talk about later. And also, I guess um, if any of you are working on an article to do with millennials and side hustle culture, this would be a good time to screenshot, take a picture of this as well, because it's some stats. So if you want this for your Excel document in case you ever work as an article to do side hustles, take it um, but yeah so that's just why I put that in there but I'm not gonna bore you to death with stats these are the only stats you're gonna see in this masterclass it's not gonna be one of those sessions um, but yeah so yeah like I said the first segment is how to maintain a full-time job and a freelance journalism career and I purposely put in brackets here and not lose your mind in the process because a lot of people kind of think especially my friends just like how do you do all this stuff and like you still come out for drinks with us you still go out to eat and I'm just like because it's time management, it's literally about managing your time. And then we're going to speak about that a bit later. But one of the things that I think if, like, I know some of you might be thinking about doing this or, or started doing it already and want, want a bit of a push or a bit of a, or some advice on how to elevate your career, which hopefully I can put, hopefully I've helped to put that stuff in here for you. But one of the things that I think is really great about it is the fact that, and I'm not sure if some of you can agree, and definitely say if you can agree in the chat, but what I love about um, the freelance journalism aspects of it is that I can, is that you can write when you want and what you want. There's no sort of, you've got to get these kind of articles, like you've got to get this. You kind of just have that freedom to kind of explore and pitch what you want to pitch and write what you want to write. And that's what I really do love about it, which is why I like kind of doing it alongside my full-time job. So yeah, how to do that, so how to do both and not go crazy. <laughs> Managing your time is really important. I think before you even venture into think, think about doing it, it's, it's really important that you master those time management skills. It's really, sorry, my screen's really dark, that's better. I was on a really dark, wow, the difference. <laughs> but yeah, it's really important to manage your time and master time management skills because you're going to need to be able to look at your calendar and know when you're busy, when you're free, and you're going to have deadlines, not just nine to five deadlines, but freelance deadlines. So it's really important to get to grips with time management. Um, and I've just put a suggestion here, and I've got a few suggestions here that you don't have to do, but I've just put them in as recommendations. 
to just spend a week or even just a few days and just really analyze your daily routine and look at like, where, like when are you most productive? How much work have you got to complete? What task have you got to do? You know, I'm very much wary that we don't all have the same 24 hours in a day. I'm very much wary that, you know, every, like you might be a carer, you could have kids, it doesn't matter, like you could have different responsibilities and I'm very much aware of that. So be honest with yourself when you're looking at this. Do you actually have the time? Because it could be that for the next few months, you haven't got the time to take on anything and that's fine, but just be very honest in this part, looking at your days and thinking, where you have the time to kind of, if you have the time to spend, you know, looking for pitching opportunities or drafting pitches and writing. So just be really honest about managing your time. And if you're really bad at it, try to get better at it before you even start the freelance and stuff because it will make your life a lot easier. And being strict with your nine to five, claiming your time, I'm very big on this. And I understand that I come, that I come from a place of privilege almost because I work in the nonprofit charity sector. So it's not that demanding. Now, if you work in the legal sector or the finance sector, different story. I've got friends who start at eight and literally finish at eight. So I never forget that some jobs is more demanding. So you can't just switch up at five and say, okay, I'm gone. But I but that's something that I think if you can, definitely do that. And what I noticed is when I used to have to work overtime and like I would leave the office at six and seven, it was because I wasn't making the most of my nine to five hours of being realistic. And I'm not here to shade anyone to come for anyone because I I will sit there and scroll aimlessly on TikTok and before I know it's been two hours. So um, so I do that all the time. But be really honest with yourself and ask yourself, if I was to just have tunnel vision and get rid of all my distractions for like an hour, could I actually finish on time today? And the chances are you probably could. So definitely think about doing that. I mean, I take extreme measures because I'm just a very extreme person. So I will literally give my phone to my mom. I lock it in a cupboard. I put it out in another room. I'm literally just a very extreme person. So if you have to do that just to get the work done, and do it because you because your aim is to kind of finish at the time you're meant to finish because no one wants to work overtime that you're not getting paid for like no, like no one wants to do that so just try to get that underway and also it makes it easier for you too because then you can do like nine to five shift have a break cook clean relax chill scroll on tiktok go on instagram watch a show on netflix take a little break then you can get into your free months right for like an hour after work you know so it just gives you that more time whereas if you were doing a nine to five you can end up finishing at eight o'clock chances are you just need to eat like you, like you can't be asked to do any more work. So just um, bear that in mind as well. And I wanted to put this, this part in because I worked in retail for so many years and I've noticed that I've said quite a lot and I'll say quite a lot in this masterclass, nine to five, nine to five. So for those who work in retail, this is definitely something you could do because I was doing it for years as well. Is if you, like, retail have got this thing about these four hour shifts, like six to 10 or two to eight or two to whatever it is, but they've got these things about these really short shifts. So what I used to do a lot of the time is like, I used to work in Topshop, Stratford before it got shut down, RIP. <laughs> and I used to work there for quite a long time. So what I used to do when I had a six to 10 shift, I would, I would come in Stratford at like two o'clock, go to the cluster down the stairs, get some work done, get some pitching done. Once I've done that, then I'd go upstairs, lock my laptop away, and start my six ten shift. I didn't do it all the time, but when I had work to do, that's what I would do. And obviously only do it if you've got somewhere safe to keep your laptop, don't just leave in the staff room and stuff because you know what can happen. But yeah, so that's what I used to do a lot. And I've also put here just to have a chat with your manager now. I've worked in Debenhams, House of Fraser, sort of Top Shop, Rhode Island, you name it. So I know that not all managers, especially retail managers are, are that friendly. I know that for a fact. So when I'm saying have a chat with your manager, I want you to kind of gauge Gauge that relationship that you have with them. Is your manager friendly? Are you like, does he understand that you have bigger goals and ambitions? Is he okay with that? Like, so just gauge that relationship that you have with the manager. And then from that, you'll be able to know if you can have that chat with them. Because a quick story, I, I did that once. I had an internship that I really wanted to do, and my shifts coincided with the internship. So I had a chat with my manager and I said, look, just for these two weeks, can I alter my shifts a bit? And he did that for me. So I was able to do the internship for two weeks. So it's just so like you never know. If you don't ask, like the worst case scenario, they're gonna say no. That is literally it, and it is what it is. But that's the worst case scenario. So definitely think about having a chat with them because you never know. Oh, can't think that. Organize your workload. So I'm hoping you guys are understanding the theme here, like with time management, being very organized. Because it, it just makes life a lot easier. Remember, you've got nine to five commitments, so you've got freelance commitments. You want to make sure that they're both fulfilled. So if you're organized, it's much more easier to just tick stuff off lists and go and just go along. So I just put some um, suggestions here for you. So creating Excel documents to track your pictures and invoices is really good. And it's really helpful for me, especially because I've got my full-time job. So if at any point I figure, okay, I've got to trace up a pitch, I can go in my Excel document and I can see what date I sent it. And the same thing with invoices. And you can also just like put like a little note in your calendar and just like count 30 days from the day you sent your invoice and just put like a little reminder on your phone to just say, 
you know, chase up anyways or schedule a chase up. So you can do stuff like that, but just always make sure that you're kind of keeping on top of that freelance work workload because it makes it a lot more easier. And I've also said to put a separate account for your freelance income because obviously if you start making a lot more money, you have to pay taxes, unfortunately. So it's just easier to put that all in a separate account. It makes your life just a lot more easier. So, um, so like I said, I hope you guys have seen the theme here of being very organized and like time management because it's just really, really, really important. Um, so this part, I've just put in some practical tips. So these are just things that I do that I've still do today, some of them, and that, that just helped me to kind of keep track of of like my freelance career as well as my nine to five. So scheduling pitch emails, I haven't got to speak about that. You know, just it's just if you do a pitch on a Sunday, you can schedule it for a Tuesday. That's the thing you haven't got to worry about it next week. You take it off your list and, and you move on. So definitely consider doing that if you don't do it already. Um, working during lunch break, something I did today <laughs> during my lunch break, I literally had a quick Zoom chat with a therapist about a piece I'm working on. So that's only ne when it's necessary because I feel like when you work a job, your lunch breaks are so crucial. So honestly, only work a lunch break if like, you've got a few last minute edits to do and the editor wants to publish the piece tomorrow or, or this evening, that's when you work your lunch breaks. But try not to overdo it because I feel like you deserve a break. Like lunch breaks are nice. So just don't try to don't always work your lunch break basically. And bringing your laptop to work with you, I think that, I think I feel like most of you probably do that already. But if you are back in the office, unfortunately, sorry, because I'm definitely not going back. But if you are back in the office, definitely bring your laptop to work with you. Um, because I like, for example, I used to finish at, at 5 p.m. my old job and I literally go around, like go around the back, go to Costa and get some work done for travels until I got kicked out and then I'd go home and relax. So definitely consider doing that. There's always these little bits of time that you can kind of take and use for your freelancing, only obviously if you have the time to do so. And making note of your busy periods at your, at your nine to five is really important because, I mean, I've done this, I'm guilty of doing this. Sometimes you get lost in the freelancing source and you just forget that, Yes, you're freelancing and it's great and you're getting pictures and it's lovely, your portfolio is growing, you love it, but you forget that you have nine to five responsibilities too and you don't want to get to that point. So it's really important to make notes of those busy periods. For example, if you've got a campaign launching in February or you've got a report during March, make a note of that and be very strict yourself and say, you know what, I'm not going to take on any commissions at this point because I'm busy and, I, and my time is going to be owed to my nine to five at this point. Do not get lost in the freelance source. I'm telling you, it's so easy to do. You just get, oh, I can do that later. And you never do it. And then before you know it, your man just calling you telling you, where's the report that was due last week? So yeah, <laughs> that, that shouldn't be you. So just make sure that you kind of keep note of those busy periods. And making time for rest and breaks. I'm a rest and break advocate. Like, please take time to relax. It's not every hour of, it, of the day you should be working. You should be resting. I really put here that I binge watch Netflix shows because my friends always like, so you do all this stuff and you still have time to watch this show in like, in like 24 hours. And I'm like, yes, I do. Because I literally make time for rest. I make time for things I enjoy in hobbies. So just make sure you're making time for rest. Like I said, it's not every single hour of the day you need to work. You deserve rest as well. Um, so should you tell your full-time job about your freelancing? For me, it's just better to be safe than sorry. It's better be safe than sorry. I think that's the saying anyway. But you guys get my drift. Yes, you should tell them basically because, I mean, the worst case scenario, you you work somewhere, you've got Tim who doesn't like you. Sorry if anyone's name here is Tim. I just thought it in my head. But yeah, let's say you've got a colleague who doesn't like you and they find out you, you're writing and they go and report to HR and stuff, or report to your manager. You just want it to come from your mouth first. Do you know what I mean? And even then, it's just it just, it just looks more professional. Just let them know and say, hey, I'm on the side, I do A, B, C, and D. Let them know. You might enjoy your HR team, whoever you feel comfortable with speaking or who you think needs to know this information, disclose it with them. And you can also look in your contract as well, because chances are it's probably written in your contract if you're allowed to do that. And um, I think from my experience, I've never had a job that had an issue with it because I work in PR. We write anyway, so they just don't see it as an issue. But please do, <laughs> I don't want to sound blunt, but please do apply common sense when it comes to this. Because if you are working in the retail sector, you're not going to write a piece about how toxic working in retail is because you will come in for your shift and you'll be fired. So just that, like use common sense when it comes to that. Make sure it's not conflicts of interest. And even and if you even get a thought that someone could take this and twist it in a different way and it could look bad on my job, don't do it. Don't do it. So yeah, I mean, unless you're willing to lose your job, but just, yeah, don't do that. So just bear that in mind as well. So like I said, better to be safe than sorry and just tell them. I just find this easier. And the importance of networking. Networking is like the scary word that sends like chills down everyone's spine because it's the idea of talking to strangers, people you don't know, they're gonna look at you, they might judge you, 
or maybe that's just me but anyway networking scares a lot of people but um hopefully for these next few slides you guys will feel a bit more kind of calmed about networking and it's really important as a freelance journalist as well because it can really help you to grow and develop your skill set as well as, as as well as find opportunities for you i'm going to share a few examples of like how i've networked my way into an opportunity before because it's just really important and i feel like networking we just have all these ideas of things that can go wrong in our head that we just need to kind of scrape away and just look at it with a clear mind so hopefully like i said in the next few slides that should kind of come more apparent so have a great quote from Issa Rae, for those who don't know, Issa Rae is the producer of um, HBO show called Insecure, one of my favourite shows, which is finished, and I'm not really um, dealing with that well because I've got nothing else to watch now, but um, <laughs> yeah, so this is a quote from Issa Rae, so I'll give you guys a few minutes to just read the quote and I'll shut up for a bit and then we'll talk about it afterwards. So yeah, hopefully you read that quote by now. Um, so I think it's really, I think when you go into networking environments, especially now that networking events are starting to happen more in person now, there's this idea that you always have to network with the editors and, and the big bosses in the room. And I get why you do that, but it's really important to network across. And you can network across online as well. You can follow writers that you like, you can jump in their DMs, you can talk, you can interact with them, you can share their articles, you can, you can always network online. But this is just, I'm using this example for like when networking in real life starts to happen again, which it already kind of has. Because I found that when I've networked with people who like I'm literally sitting next to at events, like we've ended up becoming really like good friends in, in a career sense, should I say. Whereas if like I've got a friend who likes to write about fashion, and ever since we met at an event a few years ago, if I see any pictures about fashion, I send it to her. And, and when I was writing about a race, she'd be like, look, this is for you. You should pitch to them. Like we would literally encourage each other and then we'd vent to each other about journalism stuff because. I'm not sure if you guys have ever done this before, but if you try to vent with your friends who don't work in journalism about stuff, like you being rejected or ghosted or whatever, they're just like, okay, I don't get it. Like, they just don't understand the struggles, you know what I mean? So it's good to have a friend who just gets it. But yeah, please do network um, across as well as up because it's really important because the people who you network with, you could, I've, I've networked with people who've been at events who are now editors and like doing all these, got books out and you know, one person just got an agent the other day. Like, it's like, you never know if we're gonna be in the next few years. So don't underestimate the person next to you at all. Um, so yeah. And here's to some of my networking tips. Um, hopefully these are helpful for you guys as well. And I'm, and I'm trying to like put a lot of like focus on networking because it's really important, especially when you're a freelance journalist because networking can really get you a lot of places. And because you're not working full-time in the industry, you've got less links in the industry, do you know what I mean? So you really need to go and make those and go out of your way to make those links. Um, it's, it can be a bit anxious and scary, but it's definitely worthwhile in the end. So um, I can't speak for, obviously I can't speak for everybody, but for me personally, I'm quite an anxious person. So when I go into social settings, I'm like, oh my gosh, all these people, I'm nervous, I'm just gonna be quiet and sit in the corner. And that was me for years when I first started out in, the, in as a freelance journalist going to events. One thing that's really helpful, and even for, and this isn't just for like events in person, even events like this as well, just any kind of event you go to, to set your intention. So to be very honest and be very specific about what you want to get from this event. So for example, if you're going to an event with the panelists, and one of the panelists is, is from Cosmo, and your dream is to like have your article published in Cosmo, your intention for that event would be, I want to speak to the, the editor of Cosmo and ask her for her email, because I'd like to find out more about pitching opportunities or something to that nature but set that intention for yourself. So when you go into there, you're less panicky. Because what I do find is that the thing that makes me feel anxious about networking events, and I'm not sure you guys can say in the chat if you guys can relate, but sorry about that. One of the things that I, one of the things that, um, that really like get me hot and flustered about networking events is that there is no, is that there's this idea, like I have no structure, I need structure. So I'm just going in this event and see what happens. Mm -mm, I need some sort of structure. So the intentions help give me that structure. So I feel a bit, at less ease up like okay you know what? i'm going here with an aim and a goal and what i will say about the intentions is don't be too rigid in your intentions like don't just be like i'm going to go and speak to her and i'm going to go leave no like kind of just see where the night flows see where it carries you and have those conversations be open to new opportunities and new conversations don't just go speak to the editor and then leave because again that's just networking up you should network across too so yeah bear that in mind that might be helpful for the, those who are kind of super anxious at events and you haven't got to speak to everyone in the room, being very honest, like it just looks really distasteful when you see someone just running around the room, spending like two minutes of everybody trying to catch their Instagrams and Twitter. It just look, it, it looks tacky, it looks distasteful. You're not going to get anything from it because you're speaking to them for like two minutes. 
So there's, there's no real connection, no real conversation happening here. It's pointless. So just, if you're one of those people, it just don't do that. Cause it's, it doesn't, it's, I'm sure you, I'm sure if you've done it before, you can see, you can tell that it doesn't really get you anywhere if, I'm being, if you're being honest. But just focus on making those great connections and meaningful conversations with people. Those are that's really important. You can go to an event and meet three people and those three people can, ne- can help, can send you job opportunities, they can send you pitch call outs and you can end up forming a great, a great working relationship with them. So just bear that in mind. It's not everyone you've got to talk to in the room. And following up with speakers is really important as well at events because, I mean, everyone likes a little ego, not, ego, not a stroke of ego, but everyone likes to hear that, you know, oh, I like to talk, it's really good. And obviously don't just sit there and lie to them, but you know what I mean? Like find a way to kind of connect with them after the event if, if something they said really touched you or it really inspired you or whatever it is. And if you're wondering how to do that, that's in the next slide. So this is just an example of thing, of something that I've done that I've done after an event. You can just like drop your quick email saying hey, and again you can screenshot this if you'd like, or you can get a picture of it. You haven't got to, but if you like to, you can. Um, and the last sentence should always be setting your intention. So if you want to have a quick chat with them over Zoom about pitching, if you want a pitch guide, if you want to know what they're interested in, about what they're looking for from Ryan, if you want to know about internship opportunities, just that will be your intention. But you can just drop your quick email like this and just say hey, you know. Like I'm interested, I'm like I want to talk more about writing opportunities. So definitely don't miss out on doing that. Um, and I'm gonna, I don't know if I can go back. Yes, I'm gonna share a quick example here of when I did that and I actually and I bagged myself an internship, which was really lucky to be honest. Um, so I went to a networking event years, years, years ago for editorial assistants, and there was two editorial assistants from like women's magazines that I can't remember, and one from Nuts magazine. If now for those of you who are too young to remember, Nuts. I sound really old when I said that, but yeah, <laughs> Nuts Magazine is like a lads mag. So it's like, imagine everything to do with like masculinity and football and like very like stereotypical lads kind of stuff. So PS2s and fever and cars and all that kind of stuff. And the cover was like an image of this like glossy woman who was like almost half naked and stuff. So it's not the ideal place you want to intern. Let's just be honest, but I was just hungry and any internship would do at that point. So obviously at the event it was all women. So all the women like gravitated to this other to the other two women and were talking to them and they had like crowds around them. And the editorial assistant from Zoom magazine, who was a woman, was just like sitting there with no one to talk to. So I literally went up to her and I introduced myself. We had a good old chat and I got her email address, I got her Twitter, and I literally just messaged her. Something like this. I was trying to find the actual email, but I think I deleted it because it was years ago to put here. But I literally just dropped her an email. I'm sure it has spelling mistakes in it and stuff, but I dropped her like an email and I just said, is there any opportunities to shadow with you, to, to have a chat with you about how you got, how you got your job and da, da, da. And she was just like, actually, we're looking for interns. So if you want to start, you know, next week and do an internship two weeks ago, I think it was a week, actually, you can do that. I literally came in the next week at the internship. I did miss freshers in second year, but I mean, I feel like once you've gone to one freshers, you've gone to them all. It's not, it's not that serious. Everyone just sits there and gets drunk, so it's fine. Um, but yeah, so I did that. So that was literally just by like me just reaching out to her. And I hope you guys kind of also got the gem of that story as well. If you go to an event and there's people who were like crowded with people and there's a few others who like everyone's kind of just not really talking to, definitely go and talk to them because you never know where that can lead to. And even if they can't help you, they might know someone who can help you. So definitely take opportunity because the chances are, if you go, if you go to the person who's got everyone around them, they're not gonna remember you. And then what I will say is I'm, I'm like six two, so I'm, I'm kind of hard to forget. So I have that advantage, but if you don't have that advantage and you're, and you're average hyper woman, then, um, then you're, you're probably just that, you're just gonna forget. Or get so many other English people that, that will just kind of just go past it. It's more competition. If that, one, if that person's got nobody, you're more likely to kind of get in with them. So like I said, even if they can't help you, they might know somebody who can. And that's and that's why it's important. So yeah, that was networking. So like I said, hopefully you guys feel a bit more calm about networking now. I'm hoping that was my aim. So yeah. Um, and also what's the worst that can happen? Like no one's gonna be like, oh, go away, leave me alone. Like you're just a rookie journalist. No one's gonna do this to you. And these things don't happen. Like we create scenarios in our head, nothing bad is really gonna happen. And if, and if you could tell conversations getting a bit like, like it's a bit quiet, then you just move on, you know, politely. That, that's it. That's the worst that can happen, literally. Um, so yeah, so how to find freelancing opportunities. I feel like this is like the part that everyone's kind of waiting for. And it's really kind of simple. So I hope it's not underwhelming when you, <laughs> when you look at this, these slides. Um, but before you think about that, you kind of want to get your pitching to be like grade A, grade B, not grade C, but grade A and grade B pitching you kind of want. So this part, I just thought I'd put a pitch template um, 
that I've been using for years now. So this is the kind of template that I would send to editors. Again, you can screenshot this, take a picture of it. If you're really good at pitching, you haven't got to, I guess, but yeah, you can take a picture of this. Just remember that your pitch is you telling the editor what you want to write about. You're summarizing the article. You're not writing the article. Do not get caught in that trap. You're literally saying, this is how I'm going to introduce the article. These are the main points. Here's who I'm going to interview. Here are some stats. Here's how I'm going to end it. Here's my ending point, the end. That's literally the pitch. So try and keep it under 250 words, keep it really short. Um, so like I said, you can take a picture of this as well because I haven't got to talk for the whole thing. But what I will say is that I said be tactical with the articles you decide to link. And I want to make this point clear because I've gone over this and I feel like I'm not trying to make it, I'm not making it clear enough. So if you guys didn't get it, let me know and I'll explain it afterwards. But um, so let's say you're pitching an opinion piece, right? If you're pitching an opinion piece, the links that you want to put in that bio section are going to be links to your previous opinion pieces if you have them. And the same thing with interview features. So if, you're, so if you've got kind of medium sized portfolio and you're pitching an interview piece, the links you want to put in that section want to be interview pieces because those links to indicate to the editor that yes, I can do this because I've done it before here, here and here. And that's only if you have that kind of portfolio. If you don't, then you know you just put the links there. Please only put hyperlinks. I've seen people use URLs for like the whole long, please don't do that. Please, please, please don't do that. If you, if you leave it one thing today, leave with that. But yeah, please don't do that. So just um, put the hyperlinks in there. And people will, uh, like I've been, I've been asked a few times about how to do the bio and how to do it. It should be very short to say. So for example, I would say, hi, I would say my name's Tifa. I'm from National Journalist from London. I specialize in writing about A, B, C, and D. My previous article has been published in at the, at those tactical links here, 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 here. And if you haven't said already in the pitch that you, I'd say, well, I'm best suited to write the article. So, and if it's a personal lesson, you haven't really got to say that because obviously, it's your story, so of course you, you're best to write in it. But yeah, in some cases you might have to explain that. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense as well. And I've just put a little tip on the side to check magazine websites because look, not everyone does this. And just from the top of my head speaking, I'm uh, thinking now, Wired, Stylist, iNews, Guardian Music, and Digital Spy all have their pitch guides on their website. So, and that's literally written for you guys. It's written for you to read it, engage with it, and pitch to them. So please do check them out. So if you want to pitch to them somewhere like Refinery, you type in refinery, how to pitch, or bustle, how to pitch, or Cosmo, how to pitch, and just see what comes up because they because they could have a guide online already telling you what they don't want. Like for example, Wired's guide is so detailed; they tell you exactly what they want, what they don't want. And if you go and pitch something that they don't want, that just shows you that you haven't actually done your research. So definitely do that before you pitch because you never because I'm sure most magazines have got pitch guides there somewhere that you just got to check out. And using Twitter now. I'm saying, I feel like everyone has probably got Twitter, right? But I know that I've, I've spoke to a few writers who've just like, in their career and said things like how they don't like getting Twitter because it's really toxic and, and all that kind of stuff. And whereas I hear that, I'm going to be very honest and say, nearly all the articles that you guys have seen that, that's in my portfolio has, I found through an editor tweet and a pitch call out. I've literally found them on Twitter. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you, okay, don't get Twitter, it's okay. Yeah, I think you need it. I'll be honest with you. I think you need it. Um, and I literally thought that Twitter is that Twitter is the LinkedIn for writers because it honestly really is. And those are, and those are just some examples that I screenshotted of some really of, of, of the kind of tweets that editors do. So it's not just about them putting that call out. They're, they're, I've seen editors do like long threads about how to pitch and things they wish they knew when they started their career. So you can really learn from Twitter as well. And if you're worried about getting like having like toxic content posted on your timeline and stuff, do what I did. I did like a big deep clean a few years ago go through who you're following, make sure you're liking and retweeting the same kind of post because I'm not a tech quiz, but I think if you keep doing that, you're telling the algorithm what kind of content you want to see. So I really only get like people announcing that they've got new jobs, editor call outs and PR stuff and charity stuff because I work in the sector. That's literally my whole timeline. So if anything toxic is going on, more time I don't really see it. So definitely do that if you're worried about it. And I've just put some hashtags to check out there too because a lot of people use those hashtags when they're, when they're um, looking for jobs and pitches. So, oh, check those out. That worked quick. Yeah, check those out. <laughs> but and the next one is just to subscribe to newsletters. Again, you can screenshot. Um, you can screenshot this as well. And I think I, I know I've got a few people who are listening, might be listening, from my job who are international journalists. So, hi guys from Internews. Um, so, um, for you guys, journal resources have quite a lot of fellowship programs as well that are international. So check them out. But I think the rest are all pretty much heavily like UK. So, um, yeah, can you take a picture of this? Screenshot this if you'd like. These newsletters are really good to subscribe to, especially if you're not going to get Twitter or you don't want to have Twitter, then fair enough. But get them, but then get newsletters. You need either newsletters, Twitter, or both, but you could not have you neither. But yeah, so check those out. And building and maintaining relationships with editors is really, really important. 
because I know that I feel like when you first start off there's this kind of need to kind of want because I had that to get published everywhere I wanted every magazine to have my name on their website somewhere and I, I get that desire but at the same time it's really important to build relationships that you've got with editors who you've already worked with for example there's Edda who, who I've worked with and she's changed up I think about three times in this year not this year three times in like the last few years and everywhere she's gone I've basically been commissioned by her because I've literally built that relationship with her so definitely do that because that can lead to more bylines as well and yeah and more opportunities as well so don't don't focus so much on on being published everywhere have those great relationships with those editors and, and when they move you kind of move with them that's another opportunity for you somewhere else as well and I'm not sure if you guys have noticed but a lot of young editors don't tend to stay in jobs very long like it's usually like a year or two years and they're all somewhere else so it's always good to keep them to keep them sweet by emails and keep and keep in contact with them and here's just an example of how you can do that. Um, so the example on the left is if, let's say you've just got an article published by Cosmo, I keep saying Cosmo, by L or somewhere like that. And, and you want to kind of get back with the editor and see if they're looking for any more pictures. That's the email template you can use as well. And then here's, and on the right is one, let's say you, like if you've got like a no from them or it's not one for us, it's not, it's not one for, for us, you can use this email as well on the right and just say, okay, it's not one for you, but what is one for you? Let me know. And like the last sentence is kind of like a like help me to help you basically. So I only send you good pictures. So if you get a rejection, there's like a sweet spot. So if you get like, oh, it's not one for us, in the next five to ten minutes, you gotta send this email because they're still on their email. So you wanna get them whilst they're there. Don't wait for three hours to do it instantly almost because they're literally on their email. So you've got more chance of getting a response from them. So definitely try and turn that, like try and turn that rejection into a win for you by getting some more information on what they're looking for. And it could be that 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 what you've pitched is great. It's just that it wasn't pitched right because I've done this before, and I've had Edna get back to me and say it was a good topic, but the pitch was a bit. And she literally and she literally sent me tips on how to pitch. So you never know if you catch them on the right day and they're just being very given and nice, they might do that for you. So yeah, just definitely use that as an entry point to try and build a relationship with them. And invoices, I'm going to be really short on this because I think people get really overwhelmed about invoices and I've never really, actually, let me not lie, when I first started I was the same, I was like how do I invoice, who do I do, who do I send it to, but it really isn't that deep, it wasn't that serious and I feel like a lot of you probably, because I've, I've saw a few names, I know a lot of you are journalists already so this doesn't really, this is not really for you, but um, I guess it's, so if you're looking for invoices, just literally journal resources, go on Google, journal resources, invoice template, and so invoicing and they've got a template and they've got a monthly income spreadsheet that can help you keep track of your freelance income um so yeah that's it literally and like i said before if you've got an excel document where you're keeping track of your invoices you'll know when to chase up and please do chase up um please chase up i know this whole thing of like you're kind of scared to chase up might be a bit anxious please do it and i purposely put in a closed mouth don't get fed because it's, it's astonish it's, it's the truth that you have to chase up because i'm sure some of you you know, like if some of you've got a nine to five job or job in retail, if your paycheck is not in that account where it's meant to be, you're ringing up your HR, you're finding to me, you're saying, hey, I'm in pay, what's going on, I'm not working. Do you know what I mean? Well, maybe that's just me, but that's how I'd be. So you've got to treat your freelance writing like it's your full-time job. The same way how you call up HR if you, if you don't get paid, the same way you need to email the finance team or email the editor and say, hey, I haven't been paid, can you let me know what's going on with it? Not like that, but you know what I mean? You can just say in a very nice way, one or two sentences, just let them know, just follow up with them. But don't just wait for them to figure out they haven't paid you because it could be that someone forgot to put it through. It could be that that they put that, that they got your account number wrong. It could be anything, but just find out so, because you're not writing for free, obviously. So you want to get paid. And Q and A on taxes. Now I checked this recently, so this should still be very accurate. But taxes is something you got to worry about unless you're making over a thousand um, pounds a year. So if you're not making that, have a worry about that right now. But again, even like at one point, you might be making more than that and then you've got to pay taxes. And that's where having a separate account works in because you'll be able to see how much you're making to know if, where you've got to pay it and if you've got to pay it. So, and if you want more information on that, defo, tape in, defo go on HRMC website and, call, and also give them a call because I've done that before. Give them a call and just say, look, I'm confused. What do I do? I do, and like I'm a freelance journalist, a freelance writer, what, like, what forms I've got to fill out, what I've got to do? And they're really, really, really helpful. So do that, just make sure you're paying your taxes, guys, because you don't, that's a whole different masterclass. You don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to, you don't want those problems. Um, and are freelance platforms any good? Um, if anyone could share any experiences of them using things like Upwork and people per hour and Fiverr, that's been really good, then please do, because I'm, 
I'll be honest, I'm yet to meet a writer who's used these platforms and it's been beneficial for them. And I know we see a lot of articles about, about a lot of freelance journalists and writers who, not, sorry, not journalists, a lot of freelance writers who use these platforms and make a lot of money. I've researched a lot of, a lot of these stories that I see because I don't, I don't just believe the headline, like I'm sure most of you guys don't hear as well. But why why I've realized that a lot of them are writing ebooks. They're writing ebooks, they're writing pamphlets, they're basically right, they're damn near writing dissertations. And because they can turn it over on quite a quick, on quite a quick um time scale, they get paid quite a lot. So a lot of the writers that people see making thousands in a week and I make thousand a day, and it's because they're literally writing books. They're they're it's not journalism writing, it's not blogs, it's not those kind of articles, it's it's literally that kind of writing. So just bear that in mind. I think if you're if you're maintaining a full time job and freelancing, I would say just focus on the networking, the pitching. I don't think this is worth your time. And it's, and I I've, I've and I've used that quote before. I just don't think it's worth your time. And I think the pay is really. I, mean, I don't think the pay is. That's the fact. The pay is really isn't that great. Like I've seen a thousand words, a thousand word article for thirty pounds. And bear in mind that yeah, I see everyone in your face. But and bear in mind thirty pounds is. That's not like you're not getting the full thirty pounds because you still got to pay them their fee. So you're getting about fifteen, thirteen pounds, thousand words, thirteen pounds. Yeah, exactly. So um, if you want to put the work in for that and try it, then you can. But I just I think your work if you're navigating a full time job as well, or you've got other commitments, I don't think it's worth you. Put, I think you can take the time you're going to use to put into your upward profile and put on your social media profile, put into pitching, or put into edit, and put into talk to editors. I don't think it's worth the time. But like I said, if you want to, go ahead. Next. And the downsides, this is just like come to the end of the um, masterclass now. Hopefully you guys are not tired of me talking. <laughs> but yeah, the downside to freelancing. I think I, like, I'm, I'm never going to do like a masterclass or a session about freelance and journalism in my career and not talk about the downside because like I'm not going to say, oh, it's all going to be great and you'll be sitting in a coffee shop looking mysterious whilst you write your article like Carrie Brush. Like, no, this isn't sex and tea. It's not going to happen like that. I'm going to be very, very blunt and honest in this section. And my plan, and I'll make it very clear that my like my agenda is not to put you off it. It's just to make you aware of things that can happen and make sure that you're prepared for them because I wasn't. So <laughs> at least so I'm trying to paint forward, make sure you guys are aware of these things. And here's just some of the harsh truths that I've had that that me or some of my friends have to endure whilst doing freelance um, freelance work. And not just like freelance journalism, but freelancing and side hustling as a whole. So. I had a friend who did freelance work and she works for legal and she works for a bank. She was like, she had to stop doing it because the hours she could get out of the time. So I'll give you a few seconds to read through these and yeah, just, just really get to grips with them because it could be that some relate to you and some don't. But yeah, so I'll just give a few minutes. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Yes, hopefully you've read through those um, now, but yeah. So I think the only one that I've really had that I've had to deal with is that I've had to turn now work. I've had busy periods and I've, and I've been asked, can you do this or we have to commission you for this? And I've just said, not this month, I'm way too busy. Um, obviously it sucks, but <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's something that has to be done. Because like I said, your nine to five job is like that pays for your living expenses. So let's not forget, let's not neglect those duties, but yeah. and. And it could be some of you watching, like I'm just listening now, who, who can relate to all of them. I might say, mm, cutting down every time. I can't afford that right now. And that's fine. Like it, it's okay to just say, this might not be for me right now, or I've got to sort out a few things first. I've got to save for, uh, what do you call it, an emergency fund. It could be, it's fine to have that. You haven't got to just go and do this now with hardly any time and stress yourself out. Please, please don't do that. So, yeah, just bear in mind some of these harsh truths that could happen if you do decide to do the whole freelancing and full-time job stuff and freelancing as a whole to be honest mm, rejection and ghosting oh, I hate this um I wish I could like I wish I had some sort of hack and tip and suggestion to say if you do this you won't get ghosted but I don't like I, I honestly don't and I hope you guys got the mean girl reference here but yeah um <laughs> but yeah ghosting that's I was ghosted four to five months by an editor who commissioned me so you commissioned me I wrote it and he ghosted off it was gone and it was the point that I actually DM him on Twitter and ask him what's going on. And it turns out they had like editorial issues and stuff, which I don't think is really an excuse because you could just message me. But anyway, um, the piece still got published, I still got paid. So it was a win in the end. So there's no real hack into how to not get ghosted and stuff. What I will say is just if the emails are not working, DM them, message them, keep like, keep like, stay on their backs. Like, don't just ignore them. Like, keep going until you get a response. Don't do that. I mean, it's up to you, but. 
I wouldn't do the whole, I think people do it when they add the editors on their timeline and they start ranting. That's what your like that's what your journalism friends are for. Like don't don't bring that to your profile because that even though you're in the right, you are like, like I get it, you're upset, you're frustrated, and you are in the right to be angry and upset. But that can make you look bad to other editors because they might think, oh gosh, if I don't respond to her in the day, she's gonna go off on a rant. And like I said, this is up to you and your kind of brand, but for me. That's just not part of my brand. So I would, so I'll hand you on emails, I'll hand you on DMs, but I'm not going to go and just like publicly at you and do all that because I just, it's too much. I've got things to do. Um, oh, sorry. It's too much. But yeah, and rejection. Everyone has been rejected in the pitch. Please, like, don't think it's just you. I'm sure I haven't got to tell half of you guys this already, but yeah, it, just, it happens to everyone. There's no hack on how to, again, there's no hack to stop rejection. Everyone's pitch has been rejected. And I think one thing to, to, remember, to remind yourself is that editors also have managers too. It could be that they've had a meeting on Monday and they got told, right, you've only got a set amount of commissions for mental health pieces this month. And then you come along on, on Tuesday, you pitch a fashion and beauty piece. They haven't got money to pay for you because they've been told that they can only commission pieces on a certain topic. And that can happen sometimes. So don't always take it to heart. It's not always like, oh, your pitch is bad, or your bad, or your is bad, or your bad, bad. It's some, sometimes it's literally, really sore thing so it's not always that and mental health so I wanted to say in the last slide to bring to this one is that I don't is that like my rule of thumb is that I don't worry about things I can't control I cannot control if the editor's gonna like turn down my pitch after I've sent it I can't control if they're gonna go to me these are things I just can't control once the email's sent it's out of my hands now do you know what I mean and you need to just rem and, and like remind yourself of that it's like you've got there's no point in worrying what if they see it or if they don't like it you're just it it's, there's no point in doing it just send it and go on with your day and also take a break it's it's really important I've said taking breaks about four, five times now so I'm sure you guys are gathering that I'm a big person about taking your breaks be sure to just take a break and relax burnout's real writer's block is real it's not just you to go through this we all go through it take breaks when it's necessary and like I said I do a lot of things but if at any point my mental health is compromised one of those things get dropped always because that's a priority for me so it should be a priority for you also Come to the end now very quickly. So um, this is just a really good article I read by Yomi Adejoke, one of my favourite writers, and she wrote about protecting your hobbies and the culture of the side hustle, because one thing that could potentially happen, might happen to you, is that when you turn your hobby of writing into a, a side hustle or a job, it starts to feel like that, a job. And it's and you start to kind of, oh, this is annoying, and you start to almost not like writing, because that happened to me, and I took about a five month break. This is the great thing about having a full time job, I can take that kind of break. <laughs> but yeah, and I took a break because I was literally, I wrote a piece and the piece was so bad that it got killed. And I understand why they killed the piece because it was horrible because I just wasn't in the mindset and I was still taking on jobs. And I wasn't because I just, I just saw writing as another job and it was frustrating me. And that can happen. And don't be too hard on yourself when that happens. And one thing I think you can do to hopefully avoid that from happening to you is if writing is your only hobby right now, replace that with something else. For example, when I was young, I used to love reading. So I got into reading three years ago. And if you guys followed me on Instagram before I deactivated my account, I used to do reviews all the time because now, because now I'm getting back into that hobby. So the reading hobby is replacing my writing. So if you can do something like that as well, you know, like revisit a childhood hobby you might have and stuff, but yeah, just definitely consider that as well. And just to end this whole this masterclass on, I want to use this quote, I hope I spoke to that right, but yeah, comparison is, is the theft of joy, thief of joy. Um, <laughs> But yeah, because I think a lot of times, especially with writers, we tend to compare ourselves and I'm with other writers and, you know, there's this whole announcement culture of everyone. First of all, people are getting verified all the time and you might not get verified or there's this thing about, um, which, which is not a big deal, by the way. No edit is going to turn you down because you're not verified. Like, it's not a big deal. Um, but, um, and also there's this announcement culture of everyone saying, you know, I just got my first pilot and I got my first job here. And if things are not going well for you, that is the last thing you want to hear. Like, for example, when I was really struggling um, when I left university to get a job, I deactivated my social media because I didn't. I, I wasn't in a good space. I didn't want to see everyone getting a job because I was on my tenth rejection at this point, and I was just over it. So, and it's okay to be honest with yourself. Y'all got told from this. It's okay to be honest with yourself and just say, you know what, I don't want to see this stuff right now. I need a break from it. Do that. No one's saying you're jealous. No one's saying you're, it's just. It's okay to say, if you if you're realizing that it's making you feel horrible, it's okay to take a break from that from social media if it's if it's having a negative impact on you. But yeah, I just wanted to end it on that. And here's some resources as well that are really good. Books that I've actually read that I recommend. And Journalism Assembly is really slept on. I found out about this at my full-time job. They've got a lot of like PDFs on like 
how to report about climate change, how to report on personal topics. They've got quite a lot of stuff there, so check them out. Um, they're really good. And they have some others as well. I mentioned general resources, some books that I read. Multi hyphen method by Emma Gannon. I love Emma Gannon, amazing writer. Um, that book's really good for those who are thinking of getting side hustle because she speaks about how, what it's like to be, you know, a multi hyphen person. So you're a press officer slash writer slash this slash that. It's a really good book and some podcasts on the side as well. But yeah, that's pretty much um, it. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, I was gonna give like a, a survey, um, survey monkey link to kind of ask you guys if you guys thought this was good, if it's useful, because I've done speaking events before, but this is like my first masterclass. So I wanted to make sure I was, you know, doing a good job. But so monkey was an enemy of progress, it wasn't letting me shine today, so it just kept freezing, so I couldn't do it. But yeah, please do that, like, DM me or send me an email if you think it was really useful, if there's certain parts you wish that I had, hadn't spoken over, if there's certain, like just the good and the bad, I'm happy with, just be nice, but yeah. <laughs> the good and the bad, I'm happy with. But yeah, that's pretty much it for me. And just a reminder for everyone, this is being recorded and it will be uploaded in case you want to watch anything back. Um, but yeah, that was super helpful. I, I feel like you covered all bases. I Before I jump into the rest of the questions, I'll give everyone a little bit more time to drop some in the chat. I had a question about how you go about turning down work, because I know for me, if it's kind of a big brand, I'm always a bit reluctant, even though sometimes I know I should be looking after my mental health rather than just being like, oh, I should take this on. Um, I usually, I look at my calendar a lot of the time, so my Gmail. So I actually, I actually spoke about this in the Freelance of Journalism podcast as well, about saying no. I literally, but I didn't say this as well, but I look at my calendar and I just think, and I say, hmm, the teapot on this one, can you fit this in? And I really, and I try to fit in. And if I'm struggling to fit it in, that means I can't fit in. And that took me ages. And like I said, this is the great thing about having the full-time job and the side hustle is that you've got that kind of, that, what's, what's the word? Like you've got that protection of your, of your job, of your, of your salary. But yeah, I was, like, I'm one of them people who, like, who like to be busy. Um, I, I do freelance PR, full-time job, <laughs> writing, anchoring, and um, the Instagram page. So I'm like, I'm one of them that being busy, but you've just got to make them into a priority. That should be a priority at all times. So if you look at your calendar that week and you say no, there's no time. Be on the same, you know, it's a great opportunity. And what I used to, what I always do is I have to flag it up with somebody else. So if I've got a friend who writes like me or does the kind of things I do, I just say, hey, look, do you want this job? Or I'll give them your email. So I feel like it's like, okay, good, I'm paying it forward. So I'm not like, give, I'm not creating a big burden on them because I'm saying, look, go to this person, they're free. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. But yeah, it's hard to do. It is hard because I'm one of the people who take on anything at one point. But yeah, now I've learned to be very like, no. Like right now, I'm working on two articles this weekend, and I'm just like, no, no more things this January. I'm done. And no, not doing it. So I feel like that's one for just everyone to remember. You do need to make sure you're looking after your mental health, otherwise you will burn out, and it's not pretty. Um, just jumping into some of the audience questions. Ooh, someone said to watch Harlem. But listen, been there, done that. What do you think I've been for? I <laughs> that is that was amazing. <laughs> So where do you recommend um, looking for more networking events with writers, journalists, editors? Are there any groups or newsletters? Just before you answer it quickly, I'm going to put on another networking event this year. Keep your eye out. But yeah, do you have any recommendations of where to look? Um, I mean, first of all, definitely go to that event because <laughs> I went to the, and one was really great. It was like my first networking event in years, like in person. Love, it was great. Um, event Bright. People sleep on November. I used literally, I was so hungry and I was hungry to become a writer. I would literally just type in writing events in London and I would literally get a list of them. I'd just go through them and I'd say, yeah, I'll go to London. That one's cheap. That's affordable. That's that. That's that. And I would do that. Like I said, follow general resources. And I know you guys are all following um, the platform as well. Follow, crew, like, follow all these platforms because they always post stuff as well. But that's usually how I do it. Just go on Eventbrite or just type on Google Networking, writing events in London, see what pops up and just go for it. That's usually how I do it. Would you ever consider doing your own workshop or event or anything like that? Yeah, I would. I really would. Yeah, I would. Because like I said, the whole thing about me doing Craig Girl Collective is funny story, actually. I did it. I started it about three years ago and imposter syndrome kicked my ass. It was like, why are you doing this? You're not qualified. Stop it. It literally lasted about a week and then I shut it down and I started again last year. So, no, this has always been in my, it's always been in my, like, in my blood. That sounds, sounds like a fact that we feel. But it's always been like something that I would wanted to do to help others. So I definitely would. If you guys please email me, DM me anything that you would like in the workshop and stuff in a masterclass, and I would definitely, I would definitely do it. So I just want to make sure that I make sure that I'm 
giving you that information you want because I hate when you go to master classes and they're just showing you stats. That's why like, when I showed the stat, I was like, guys, it's only one slide. I'm not going to bombard you with stats in the history of journalism. We're not here for that. <laughs> but yeah. It's such a common thing. I feel like journalists, unless you're a finance or kind of something to do with numbers, I don't know, we drop maths for a reason. We chose a writing-based yeah. career. It's what we're here for. We've had two questions about Twitter, so I'm going to ask it as a two-part situation. What are your thoughts on using Twitter as a platform to ask for commissions? And do you use Twitter to find sources? I use Twitter to find sources, yes. And I definitely recommend doing that and using the hashtag um, journal, not journal, journal request, yeah, journal request as well, because a lot of people pick it up and they retweet it as well. Definitely use Twitter. Use um, one that slept on, and I work in a charity, so I'm telling this for a fact. Contact charities. Charities will get you the statement, will get you the person. So if you're writing a piece about, so for example, I worked for HIV charity and we have people saying, we want to speak to women living with HIV or activists and we will do it straight away. So if you want someone who's lived, got lived in health experience or story, contact charities because they will most definitely give you a quote. But yeah, I use Twitter. Twitter is the best one. Just type in what you want, journal resources. I mean, journal um, requests and see what comes up. And it was the first part to that as well. Then there's the request. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on using it to ask for any commissions? Because I've seen a couple of people just tweet like, I'm open to commissions for any editors who are following. You know, I've done that before. I didn't get anywhere with this. <laughs> I'm not too sure. But I mean, I see some people do it and they've got people like commissions that are saying, DM me now. And so it does work. And I, when I do see other writers do it, I do always retweet it and stuff. But that doesn't work for me, but why not? You know? What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is what happened to me. No one just replies and they just like it and retweet it. You. Worst case. So yeah, try it. <laughs> and do you have any recommendations about how to improve your writing and self-confidence to pitch articles? Um, ooh, how to improve? See, I think mine came, just came, just came natural I got, as I got more experience, but how to improve your confidence in writing. Be comfortable with the kind of style and tone that you write. Do not... Don't look up right and say, I wish I could write like them. Be comfortable with your tone. For years, I used to beat myself up about not being one of the smart writers who use all these big terms and these big words. And then I realised that what makes my writing so unique and so amazing is that I talk to you like, and I'm sure like you guys can tell now, I talk to you like a friend or like a, or like a bigger sister. I don't talk to you like, oh yes, and then, by the way. And I, don't, I talk to you like I'm your friend and that's, and that's my writing style. So Read your, so read your articles, really come to grips with your kind of style and admire that. That's that, that's your unique selling point. Don't go pay yourself to other writers. You've got your own style. And yeah, just, just live in it. And just and if it takes a bit of delusion to just say, yeah, I mean, I'm a great writer and I'm, I'm amazing, do that. You know, works. Fake it till you make it. So yeah, <laughs> definitely hope that, that helps. That is such great advice. Because I've had the same thing, you know. I don't use a lot of big words, but I think it's also worth remembering some people are great writers and some people just throw a load of buzzwords into their articles. Just because someone is using words with five or more syllables, it doesn't automatically make them a good writer. You know, you don't need to be using a thesaurus on every other word. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I mean, I've read some articles and, I, and I, like, I didn't know what the hell they were saying. I've gone to research and I thought, oh, that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I think part of being <laughs> a good writer is being able to write concisely as well and in a way that people can actually understand. Um, yeah. And I think also, uh, just a good quick, a quick task, I just thought about this now. Write down what you want your readers to get from your writing. Set your own, so set your own definition level of success. If you want your writers to understand what you write, to laugh what you write, to relate to it, set your goals for it. And if, and if when you post your article, publish it, if you get someone saying, oh, this is relatable, I find it's funny, you win. You're a great writer because you're a great writer on your terms. That's what you wanted to do. You've done it. That's a really nice idea. Um, yeah. Last, I think, actually, we probably have time for more questions. How do you come up with story ideas for pitches? Is it brainstorming? Is it just you have an idea at 3 a.m., write it down, pitch in the morning? Yeah. I'll have an idea randomly. I'll be looking at something and I'll just say, oh, yeah. and I'll write it down. Or, or if I'm really, if I'm actively looking for ideas, I'll like look at news, I'll like read back some of the headlines that come up and I'll say, okay, what's missing from this story? What, like, what perspective have we, have we got from the story? And then I'll say, okay, I can pitch that. And I do stuff like that. So yeah, but a lot of the time I'm just clearly doing something random, like, oh, that's a good idea. And I just write it down and I try to work on it from there. 